Welcome to the Limbrandon Live, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Adrian. Thank Young. you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, sir. Yes, it is a privilege to have Dr. Young here, Dr. Adrian Young. Dr. Adrian Young is a dermatologist and also a dermatologist surgeon. There is not many dermatologist surgeon in Malaysia. In another word, he is a skin specialist. Adrian did his medical studies and training in UK. And however, he has decided to take a decision to come home and serve his country and his family. And today, Dr. Adrian is a resident doctor for AY Skin Specialist Clinic and specializes in skin disease and aesthetic medicine. So today, Dr. Yong will discuss in length with us his success in life and the secret of aesthetic medicine, bringing out the beauty in you. So, let's welcome Dr. Adrian Young. Thank you so much, sir, for coming to the show. Thank you. You know, it is a privilege. I knew you from a very uh, different circumstances, right? I got to know you when one of my cousins had a skin problem and he came and see you. And I was figuring out how to write the medical report. And mm -hmm. I came and saw you, right? Yes. And that was done. You, you help us a lot in getting the medical report done. Thank you so much. That's how we met. Yes. And we got right. to know each other better and things just roll on from there. And it's such a privilege to have you here. So, Adrian, tell us, tell us a bit of your background and, and where are you from? Okay. I'm originally from Seremban, uh, but I was born in University of Malaya in PJ. Because my dad was then a medical officer working in the hospital. Uh, before he then decided to move back to Seremban to start his own private practice at the time. Yeah. So, you were saying your father is a doctor in UM, then moved to private practice in Seremban. So, your father is a medical doctor. Now, in your early childhood, I, I'm sure that you have seen your father work with patients and work the clinics. Uh, how did your father inspire you? Yes. So the first thing actually, uh, the first way I knew my dad was a little bit ironic. It was not that, you know, I was sitting next to him, like how I am sitting next to you, and that the patient was in front of him, and I saw how good a doctor he was. How I found out how good a doctor he was, was at school. Oh, you're Dr. Yong's son. Oh, on the street, it's like, you know, I've got a problem now, I need to go and see Dr. Yong. So I felt that, you know, he made such a big difference in Seremban, that his name was well known on the streets, and, you know, he was making a big difference. But as his son, I rarely saw him. I always heard his, his name much more than I saw him. Yeah. But yeah. that really inspired me that he dedicated his whole life to treating his patients. Even late at night, you know, uh, 9, 10 p.m. after he's closed his clinic doors, sometimes you get a call from a patient who says that their mom is very ill and they're living in a small district in Rimbao. And they'll say, can you come over for a house call? And he would go straight there. You know, the supper in his car, he was about to bring it home to feed us. But he said, just wait for another half an hour. He drove to Rambao. Yeah. So he did it out of love and out of passion, out of care and concern for his patients. And that really inspired me as a young boy. I'm sure that you are so proud of Father, right? Yes. You, 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 you try to emulate, emulate his life and become as best a doctor you can. And he has helped so many people. In, in the town of Seremban. Mm -hmm. where, where is his clinic actually? Oh, actually it's in Jalan Tuanku, Munawe. And it's been for the last 15, 20 years. Young Specialist Clinic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been there for many, many years. Yeah. So your father is also a specialist? Yes. He was a gastro specialist. But in those uh -huh. days, there was no specific, uh, you know, sort of specialization courses in Malaysia. So it was more of an apprentice where you would learn uh, the ropes, and then, uh, you know, you start to start doing the procedure slowly. But time has changed and now there are very structured programs to uh, specifically specialize in certain medical specialties. And uh, you have to enter the courses to be able to be trained and fully get a stamp at the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why, why, why didn't you go actually and become a gastro, but then you decided to do skin? Yes. So everyone's journey is different and my journey was different. A lot of the uh, influence that I had was when I was, uh, because I spent time overseas in the UK, right? I grew up as a boy in Seremban, but I then went to Singapore. Uh, I was living in a boarding school all by myself. 
for four years under the ASEAN scholarship. And then from there, I applied to the UK to do medicine. And when I got in, I wanted to chart my own path. I wanted to have an identity and not be uh, just like my dad. Secretly inside, I would have always felt that I want to be version two of my dad, which is a better and more successful doctor than he is. So not that a dermatologist is more successful than a gastroenterologist, but I would say that you know, my main interest when I got into university was that in you know, uh, making sure that people had the confidence to be able to do what they want in life. And a few experiences when I was there, including a fellow classmate who almost dropped out of medicine because they had very, very severe acne with scarring and uh, they were getting depressed, you know? And a simple tablet and a visit to the dermatologist managed to change their life around. And they then succeeded and became in, uh, you know, one of the distinction students. And that was my first thing, you know, that there are a lot of people who just say, look, you know, skincare is just superficial, it's not important. But there are a lot of people out there who are suffering incredibly, both physically and mentally, and even until today, uh, I'm very proud to say that there are patients who come to me and they come in crying and they leave smiling and laughing. And I think that really makes it worth the while. Now, you're saying that, you know, that, that is quite an amazing story, right? You came from a small town of Seremban and you went to, you went to Singapore to under the ASEAN scholarship, with, which, which is the smartest of Malaysian actually only can apply like, right now. And from there, you're boring school, and then you went to UK. If you look at yourself from your young age, right to boarding school and right to doing medicine in UK, what is that thing that makes you so successful in what you do in every stage of life? Yes, I think the key ingredient here is focus. And I think I'm a very focused individual, so much so that um, when I have something in my mind, I normally just kind of, uh, I'm like a horse with two blinders on and I will keep going until I get it. So I think that that's the key thing about it. Um, if I've set my mind to doing something, I do not give up. Mm -hmm. So meaning from young, you knew that you want to be a doctor just like your father? Yes. Then, but when you were in UK, you decided that you want to lose skin? Yes, correct. Yeah. I actually explored a lot of the different options. Mm -hmm. I even explored cardiology, I explored plastic surgery, I explored, uh, you know, radiology. But in the end, the people who inspired me the most uh, and the experiences that I had were all skin related. And, uh, you know, and that's how I, I got into it. So how many years were you, were you in UK? Okay, so from the time I went, I was uh, 17. And by the time I left, uh, I was 35. School for, uh, full scholarship? Well, the first part, of course, in Singapore was a full scholarship. Uh, in the second part in university, my dad helped me a lot. All right. Okay. And it's a debt that I'm trying to pay back. Uh, but I don't think, you know, at his stage, money is a concern. It's more to do with the uh, image. I think it's more to do with what has become of me, what I can contribute to society and what I can match. So what he contributed to Suramban, I'm hoping that I can contribute to the whole Klang Valley. And Fantastic. this is an improvement of uh, what he is. That is wonderful, you know. It is about serving, not taking, you know, giving and not just taking, right? I think that attitude makes you who you are today. And your clinic, his, uh, Dr. Yong's, uh, Dr. Adrian Yong's clinic is at Damansara, uh, Uptown Damansara. That's right, yeah. Just right opposite Starling Mall. Right, it is quite visible. Later we'll show you uh, where the clinic is and, and you'll be able to find him. Now tell us, you, you, spent, you spent actually close to 18 years in UK and you had a family then. Correct. You, had, you were married. Yes. Your wife is also a super achiever. <laughs> <laughs> right? His wife is a super achiever. Your wife is an in, uh, international uh, banker. Yes. She was working with yeah. Some uh, real great good banks. Yes. And, but you, you guys decided to come back to Malaysia. Yeah. Why? Okay, two main things. Her dad is alone now. Unfortunately, her mum passed away when she was young. And uh, a lot of her siblings are, have already emigrated. And we felt that, you know, for um, our parents to have sacrificed so much, 
uh, and to have uh, paved the way for us to achieve our dreams, I think the least we could do is to uh, come back and be able to be around uh, in times of need. And I think that was one of the main things that we were considering, the main factor. Uh, the second thing, of course, is uh, you can't take the Malaysian out of me. Even after many years, my diet, uh, my habits were all very Malaysian. Still want to drive everywhere. I still want to eat Malaysian food. I was the only one who would be microwaving sandwiches in the hospital queue. And two steps behind me was my other Pakistani consultant, who was also microwaving sandwiches. <laughs> because we can't take cold sandwiches in our stomach. You see, so we need hot food, good food everywhere. So I think that that's the second thing. Uh, and of course, the third thing is, uh, when I managed to specialize in dermatology there, uh, when the blinders off, was off my, the size of my eyes, and I looked around and I thought, okay, I've reached a, uh, a stop here. Where should I go next? And I looked at my options and I thought the ratios of uh, the number of skin specialists in Malaysia, population is about 30 over a million. Mm -hmm. There's about 100 specialists only. There is only 100 skin guys in the whole Malaysia who is in national home. specialist registered. Okay, those are like dermatologists plus dermatologist surgeon. Dermatologists only. Oh. So, whereas in the UK, you're talking about a uh, population, of course, larger, but their consultant numbers are about five or six hundred. So, in any single hospital, you have about seven or eight consultants, even in every single city you're talking about. All the football cities you can name, there'll be at least seven or eight consultants there. In Malaysia, most states will have only one consultant. Sometimes one consultant serves three or four states. Hmm. We are so un we are not under uh, we are not underserved by doctors, but we are underserved by certain specialty. Correct. Certain specialty. Yes. It's just like the vascular guys. There's only twenty six of them yes. in the whole nation, yes. but the vascular guys does all the diabetic food, mm. all the pots and all that, mm. chemo pots and all that. Mm. So that that is the thing. Mm. So as a derm surgeon. Your job is not just to see skin problem, right? Correct. Yes. So tell us what does a dermatologist surgeon does? Okay. Now, my main bulk of work when I was in the UK was uh, skin cancer surgery. So, but of course, skin cancer is not as uh, prevalent in Malaysia as it was in the UK. I'm, was, I'm talking about something like 10 to 15 cases of uh, excisions or removals per day of skin cancers. And even at that rate, as a trainee, as a consultant, we were not able to clear the backlog because there were that many skin cancers. Okay? Now, my, my main task when I come back is basically acne cysts, boils, uh, and then um, past areas because of our weather, it's very hot, it's very humid. A lot of those uh, conditions, boils occurring on the face, uh, in the armpits and so on. So that's the main bulk of work. The second uh, bulk of work is that of uh, you know, scars, keloids, which are overgrowing on the chest, on the arms, uh, on the back of ears. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, that is where it's a very, very nice position to be in, where we can play with lasers, because I love technology, uh, and combine you know, scalpel, the appropriate use of that, and lasers to give patient the best. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I first came back to uh, Malaysia, uh, I had big dreams in setting up all these things in University of Malaya. Mm -hmm. okay. But there are limitations to uh, what we can have as a, you know, in terms of funding, in terms of setup, and in terms of uh, job scope. And I think that was the main thing that I felt that, you know, as I've mentioned before, <laughs> that once I have uh, the blinders on, I'm very focused at what I want. I want to be able to practice dermatology at its best. And the only way I could find that is not even in a hospital, it's only in my own practice where I can define exactly what the parameters are. That's why when I visit your, your, your clinic, it doesn't feel like a Malaysian typical clinic that you find every, anywhere. Your clinic feels like you're in London. You know, it's, it's, it's different. There's a slope going up to the clinic, you know. Yeah. The doors, of course, is bigger. That's the clinic standard. But the aesthetic and everything is, is very different. It's, it's different, uh, you know. I think, I think you set it up purposely that way, right? Yes. I think the priority that I that always had is accessibility. 
And I want to be able to cater not to just people who are concerned about their looks, but also people who may be in nursing homes, people who may not, uh, you know, from the early days I mentioned that my dad used to do house calls, mm. right? That I want them to be able to access it via wheelchair. So we have parking right in front of the clinic. I actually spot, chose that spot so that we can have our own private space so that if they booked an appointment, they can actually come in through that access door. Yeah. So you choose to have a clinic in Uptown Damasara, but at a semi a bungalow, I think. Yes. It yes, is right. a bungalow. So, yes. so that's why he has a private parking. It is quite easy to actually go to his clinic. Basically, I always park in front of the clinic. There's always spaces. Sometimes there's no spaces. There's too many patients. <laughs> but anyway, most of the time they are, right? And it's just a walk away from Starling Mall. So it's very, very easy to, to access. And I love that slope, you know, that wheelchair slope to your clinic. And that actually brings a lot of thinking into actually setting that up. Nice job, you know, very nicely done. Now, uh, the, the next thing I'd like to check with you. Um, so, aesthetic medicine. All the ladies out there, this is what you're waiting for. Aesthetic medicine, making you beautiful, right? Now, about aesthetic, what good does aesthetic medicine bring to people? Tell us about aesthetic medicine in general first. What is that? Okay, aesthetic medicine is defined as uh, you know the art and the science combination in improving a person's appearance. That's basically a definition, mm -hmm. and that definition can be quite fluid. Why? Because if you feel that you've got enough hair, and I was going to tell you, you know, I can make you grow more hair, you will not be happy with me. Mm. So the definition of an improvement in appearance has to be the marriage between what the patient wants and what the doctor wants. I think that's the most important aspect. When that starts to diverge, you start getting horror outcomes, yeah? where things don't look so good, don't look natural, and in fact, maybe over the top, to the point that there are people who will be kind enough not to say anything, but they clearly feel that it's distasteful. And I think we have to be very careful because when aesthetic medicine is overdone, you can have uh, adverse outcomes. It actually yeah. makes it look worse than before. So let's see some of the things that you do. Let's switch to the slides and presentation that we have prepared earlier. Okay. So this is some of the things that Dr. Young, uh, Dr. Adrian, can I just call you Dr. Adrian now? Yeah, that's, that's fine. fine. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that is easier. This is some of the things that you do. And I can see eczema on children. Is that eczema on children? Yes, very yeah. common. Very common. My second child actually uh, suffer from this very, very, very much. Yes. So you do see eczema, yes, and adults and children as well, yeah. right? Yeah. So and, yeah. I'm proud to say, out of all the eczema patients that I get, I tend to get the very complicated ones, which is good. Why? Because they have been to probably four or five uh, other doctors, mm -hmm. and they have not found a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's very satisfying when I can get to the bottom of things and give them a cure. That is great, you know, I, you know, for that, uh, I must compliment you. A lot of people actually look for the easy way out. You know, I've been, I've seen one of the uh, dentists that I saw. I went in for a feeling. I said, could you actually, um, he did, he did a temporary feeling the first time, then second time it came off, I went there. And he gave me another temporary feeling. So I told him, doctor, could you give me a permanent one so that it lasts longer? You know what he said? He said the temporary one that lasts you for eight months. What's wrong with that? I'm like, oh my God. You yeah. know, a lot of people look the easy way out. Yes. Yes. But I like your attitude. Your attitude is that you like to do the hard thing and get it done. Yes. yes. My third child is actually grown out of eczema. That's the lucky thing. Uh, she still has some problem. Maybe later you want to see her. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So tell us about this, uh, Adrian. Yes. Uh, this is, what do you call this condition? This is vitiligo. V-I-T-I-L-I-G-O. Vitiligo. And it is an autoimmune condition, which means your immune system uh, decides to attack your own pigment cells. So the pigment cells reside on the top layer of our skin. Okay? And the purpose is to give us sun protection. So for pigmented skin, for example, Chinese, Malay, and Indian, African skin, in the order of getting more and more melanin or pigment, it becomes more obvious as a problem if you're dark skin. 
So vitiligo still exists in Caucasian people too, but they are never as psychologically affected as the darker skinned people. And in fact, such a condition in India is thought to be a condition where a potential son-in-law would be rejected. Why? Because this condition actually mimics or looks like very much like leprosy. Ah. So leprosy can be white, it can be a rough patch, maybe they are you know, losing nerve Lim processes yeah. and limbs and so on. So you know, I think this is a condition which is very emotionally loaded, okay? in the sense that it really affects someone's self-confidence. And I know of uh, my lady patients who have this, and they would spend at least 10-15 minutes every day just to make sure that the makeup will cover it up completely before they leave the house. Now, is there a cure for this? Anna? Unfortunately, not at this stage. But I would say that there are a lot of treatments available to control it. So creams are always the first line. And then phototherapy, which we offer in our clinic. And then thirdly, pigment cell transfer, which is surgery. To transfer the pigment cells from one area to, area to another. A bit like hair transplant, but using the transfer of pigment stem cells into the site. So can the patients... Can our patients go and see you on this? Yes. They can. Do you do this surgery and do this transplant and, and all the lasers that you're saying just now? Yes, we do. Yeah. So how was it? Will it actually 100% cure or, or make better like 90% or 80%? Yeah. Now, with time, given three to six months, I would say that majority can improve by about 70 to 80%. Okay? Okay, but, that's not bad. Yeah. However, certain areas, for example, around the mouth, and on the back of the hands, those are the most challenging parts where we have to keep hammering with a very, very high dose. When we say hammering, it refers to using very high dose medications and also using phototherapy at high doses to try and achieve what we, what we need to achieve. Mm. Yeah? But yet again, it is much improved. You know? Yes. Okay. So if you have, uh, to the audience outside, if you do have know somebody who have this problem, Dr. Adrian is some, somebody that you can go and have a look and see him. Now, this is skin cancer and psoriasis? Correct, yes. yes. So, skin cancer on the top is also known as a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Now, this is very common. So, basically, the risk factors are excessive sun exposure, genetic background uh, risk factors. So, it can occur anywhere. And the scary part, it, it may look like an age spot. And uh, very commonly, this is underdiagnosed in Malaysia because very few of us would think of it. But having seen about 10 to 20 a day during my training in the UK, um, I would recount the experience in UM when a patient came in and kept telling me about his legs and all I could do was stare at his nose. And he said, what's wrong with me dog? And I said, you have something that's a lot more important than what you're trying to tell me and I think we should remove it today. And the Which truth, is skin cancer. And true enough, yeah, two weeks later, the biopsy came back, and of course we treated his legs as well. But it was one of those stories that I always remember. Yeah. <laughs> right. So psoriasis is something quite... It happens on the scalp, but sometimes it happens on the other part of the body as well, yes. right? Now, the thing about psoriasis is it's not, just, uh, skin, uh, it's not just a skin disorder. People will see it as a disorder that is uh, psychologically and socially unacceptable. They can't go swimming, they're embarrassed. Uh, every time when they sit down on a sofa like this, when they leave, they leave a lot of dead skin behind. Okay? Those can be embarrassing factors. However, what is important is the fact that psoriasis is associated with other conditions. For example, joint problems, known as psoriatic arthropathy. So the arthritis is very similar to things like rheumatoid arthritis, where you get joint stiffness, pain in the heels, maybe in your knees, your hands, mm -hmm. and you can't really move properly for about half an hour. Then that gets better. Uh, mm -hmm. Then nail disorders, where their nail will start to lift up, become very brittle, and you would want to you hide them because they are very unsightly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the hidden diseases, so metabolic syndrome, like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol. Those have all been linked to psoriasis. So for all my patients who have psoriasis, I always tell them to try and reverse all those risk factors, and their psoriasis tends to get better as well. I have a friend... This young guy uh, who is in his I mean, mid-twenties and he has this problem of psoriasis on his foot and they've seen quite a lot of uh, dermatologists and he has been doing injection. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, and he said it helps, but once it's off the injection, it, it comes back again. Mm. What do you say about that? Yeah. So it depends on what kind of injections you're referring to. But of course, if it's the biologic injections, which are, uh, can be on the pricey side, it actually tackles the whole uh, root cause of the problem. But of course, we can't get to the absolute root, which is gene therapy. Because the problem is with the genes, and that is expressing itself in a way that causes the skin to turn over very quickly and to promote inflammation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So things like, for example, alcohol consumption, uh, stresses, and taking the wrong medications can cause a flare. Right? Now, so the injections, the fact that we can get to a point where injections can control it completely, meaning that you might see him on a day-to-day -day basis and you think he's been completely normal, I think it's a good enough progress for the moment. Okay? But they're, of course, very expensive, very pricey to maintain. Yeah? You're talking about thirty to 35000 a year. Okay? It's like paying for a private school fee for the rest of your life because basically this condition can last 10 to 15 years. All right? But the better way is to look at it more holistically. If you can make uh, lifestyle changes, dietary changes, that will be, of course, good. Uh, and uh, of course, if you use topicals, uh, phototherapy, uh, and other uh, tablets and, and treatments that are more cost effective, that can make you go further. Mm -hmm. Because the average cost of all the other things are around five to 10,000 a year, rather than 30 to 40,000 a year. Mm -hmm. yeah. So some other things that you do, let's mm -hmm. go to aesthetic, right? Yes. So let's go to the interesting part. Okay. Aesthetic medicine now, um, this is, what is this? Tell us, what is this? Okay, so the picture of the lady before is the same lady as the one that's mm -hmm. below. But the difference is, uh, number one, if you look at the forehead lines on the top, okay, which we can reproduce here, and also when you smile and you have this crow's feet at the side. Yeah. Now, all these are due to uh, muscle overactivity. And a very common problem that people have when they are getting old is that they start to have uh, you know, long-sightedness and they have to keep doing this. Ah. And the line in between can get very deep and the 11 lines become extremely deep ah. and unsightly. There's also habitual movement where every time when you talk to them and they just do this and this and this and then they have those exercise book lines on the top. Ah. Yeah. So these things can be solved by injecting very small doses of Botox. And when I say small doses, I mean small doses. Because the uh, Botox was, a, was something that originated from the US. And the doses, just like the portions of the food, are a little bit larger than what Asians consume. <laughs> And I think that's where the translation of practice is a, is a problem. When you start using the American or the British system in terms of the dosing, you mm. run into problems. Yep. And I certainly had that experience when I first came back from UK with that. So now Botox, is it safe? Yes, it is a very safe uh, medication, FDA approved, provided it's original Botox. So the horror stories that you've heard is unlicensed products, pirate copy products, uh, products that are injected by non-medical staff uh, that may be diluting it or mixing with other contaminated products. And I heard people telling me uh, on the internet, they say after you put in Botox, if it's put in too much, then you have what we call the plastic face syndrome. Yes. So does it really cause that, Botox? Absolutely. Which is why I say if you follow the charts of the uh, originator, the people who actually started using Botox initially, and you just follow it by the books, you will get a plastic face. But if you start using it in adjusted doses according to how much muscle activity and you tailor make it to your muscle activity, then you'll be very natural looking. Uh -huh. so you have to be very careful. Yeah. So ladies, you heard him. It is, it, it takes skills to do Botox. So you know, better do it with the right guy, right? Better do it with a legal practitioner, a person who really know yes. how to do this. All right. So now we know the answer. So let's go back to this. This, wow, my mother will love you. My mother have this and she's trying to get rid of this. So what, these are, uh, what do you call it, sun freckles? Sun or spots or sun spots. solar lentigo. Mm. Okay. And these are accumulated over uh, the years. And it may show her commitment as a good mother for bringing her kids to school, uh, driving them or True. even walking under the hot sun. And that's why there's so much sun. True. Or maybe she was working a stall, you know, True. so on. So these things are accumulated sun damage, damage to our DNA, which has caused this uh, protective mechanism to appear. But it does make you look 
uh, more, uh, how to say, unclean and perhaps less uh, desirable, okay? And less confident perhaps because, um, you know, when this lady came to me, she was uh, putting a lot of foundation makeup over it. When she first came, she said, you know, uh, I have a big pigment problem and I couldn't see it at all because mm. it was covered with big makeup. Uh, but that's the final result without makeup. And uh, she was very, very happy after that. So I think, you know, there are technologies. Uh, not everything should be lasered. Okay, beware. Because there are certain conditions like melasma, which is actually a hormonal condition, which is a little bit like vitiligo, where it's not curable. And one has to be careful that laser isn't an answer to everything. A lot of patients come in and say, okay, I want this laser, I want that laser. Then when I tell them what can be lasered and what can't be, bring them down, then you can understand what can be achieved and what can be achieved safely mm. rather than you know, something that you imagine from uh, other perhaps advertisements that you've seen. Mm. Yeah. So at the, end, at the end point is actually going to see a person who actually really knows how to do this. Mm. Not just a deep derm, mm. you know, diploma in derm. There's a lot of GPs who take deep derms and, mm. and say they are derms, right? But they actually to see a real dermatologist, right? So this lady, so this, this looks like a facelift. Mm, yes. is, it, is it a facelift? Well, it's a non or minimally invasive facelift mm. in the sense that in the olden days, uh, plastic surgeons, derm surgeons would actually excise the areas around here on the sides of the ear mm. and then stitch up the whole tissue to pull up. So excise that means cut? To cut, yeah, to cut. Yeah. Yeah. But nowadays we can use less invasive methods so you can see the, the four little plasters there. Mm. That was to mark out the areas where we've put a thread in there. So you know the threads that are used to stitch after you've had surgery, mm -hmm. uh, after let's say you have a C-section, you know that kind of stitches. Mm -hmm. But this is modified to last longer, about mm -hmm. nine months a year. And not only that, the uh, stitches have actually been adapted and uh, made to have little barbed areas on the side to be able to lock down the tissue and suspend it. So this can be done uh, on an outpatient basis. You don't have to be put to sleep. Mm. Okay? It's just injected with local anesthetic and you can achieve this, you walk out in half an hour. Mm. So you are saying I can get a facelift without cutting through my face from my forehead to my ear, mm. but I actually put a thread across to get the same effect. Yes. And That's safer. Right. Yes. Certainly so. Wow. So the plastic guys must still, do they do the same thing? Yes, the plastic surgeons actually do threads. There are also other technologies like high intensity focused ultrasound, which is a machine based uh, device to try to achieve the same thing. But of course, for the more severe cases, you know, if you want to subtract 15, 20 years, then facelift is still the way to go. The Still. durability, yeah. It depends on how long you want it to last. But most people nowadays, they are healthy, they are fit, and they don't want to undergo surgery. They don't want to have a long downtime of hiding away from people for three weeks to a month. Uh, even with the uh, MCO and even with the mask regulation, <laughs> they're still very wary of uh, having that kind of downtime. Yeah. Now, tell us, Adrian, how young can a patient come and see you with this? For facelift like yeah. this? Okay. So for a track facelift, I would say that the ideal candidate is someone who has lost some weight, okay, and perhaps has some sagging fat which is descending, earliest possible mid-40s. Okay. Now if you're younger than 40, then I would suggest doing high-intensity focused ultrasound, which is a machine-based device first to maintain it. Because having a thread put in at that age might put you off <laughs> beyond that. Because mm -hmm. once you put a thread in, mm -hmm. of course it's a procedure, uh, there is a uh, material that is in there that with time will start to stimulate the collagen and tighten up. But there is a material there that will change your face structure. And you would only want to do that at a later stage when your bone starts to recede. Rather, when, when, rather than when you're still young and you have a lot of volume uh, mm. to, you know, to make up for it. So the thing is that do not do it too young. Mm. Do it at around mid-40s yes. or early 50s. Yes. Yeah. So ladies, you heard it. Can men do it? Yes. 
do they do men come to you and do it? Yes, they have. And mm. mainly, actually, it's more popular for men because they want guys are more like uh, the way they shop are very similar to women as well, where they want a quick thing. They walk in, they get it, they walk, walk out. So actually, more men than women prefer this approach to mm. lifting. Yeah. All right. Because it's a quick fix. Yeah. So do you think I need it? Well, I think you are perfectly fine at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very healthy. Yeah, just too nice. <laughs> So let's talk about this. Yes. So what's this? This is like a... Um, okay. Mm. So the first thing to look at is the lower eye bags in the before picture, in the top picture. And then below you can see the uh, eye bags disappearing somewhat. And what I've done there is inject fillers just under the groove here, on the bone, which does two things. Firstly, when you put more volume here, it lifts up the skin and create this lifting effect. So the cheeks don't look so heavy anymore. Secondly, mm. you can also open the eyes up and the eyebrow by injecting a little bit here. Okay. Mm. So it's basically like scalp face thing. Uh, uh, the face sculpting, sorry. <laughs> yeah, face sculpting, where basically we are injecting the fillers in to achieve the shape that you want. Mm. So the same thing can be done for the chin, same thing can be done for the nose, and so on. Yeah. The other common indication is having sunken temples. As one gets older, it gets very sunken in and look old. We can actually inject fillers in here as well to fill it up on the sides. Mm. Now, uh, you, you're, you're injecting uh, what kind of material? The silicone, Sindol or...? No. No. Silicone is uh, no longer used and it's a very dangerous product to use. It's illegal to, to do that, right? Yes. 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 So we use hyaluronic acid now. So hyaluronic acid is actually mm. part of our skin. Mm. We produce hyaluronic acid okay, and it's broken, by, broken down by an enzyme called hyaluronidase which is present in, under our skin as well. Mm -hmm. So the difference with the hyaluronic acid which is injected in, it's, it's processed such that it's cross-linked so that it will last longer. Mm -hmm. So about a year, a year and a half for it to last there. And the way it works is it draws fluid in so that it allows the tissue to look plumper and have more fluid. So it's not meant to last forever? Uh? No. So basically after one and a half or two years, they have to come back and redo it again? Yes. Something and like a... a uh, repeat yes. uh, procedure yes. to make you continuously look young. Yes. However, the reason for that is very good. Why? Mm -hmm. Because, for example, if you were to inject a fixed material like silicone in there, mm -hmm. okay, like for example, you are 48 now, and you think, okay, I'm deficient here, I'm going to inject silicone there. Mm -hmm. Now it will look good. Five years later, maybe not so good. Ten years later, you will look awful. Why? Because the bone recedes with time. The eye socket deepens, the bone recedes, the skin gets loose. So what happens is you're left with lumps that stick out, which are permanent there. Whereas your skin has been hanging down like drapes or curtains, which are already not supporting the structure, and the bone is already gone, far gone. So you basically you have like a tennis ball or whatever under the skin. Mm. So having permanent things injected is never a good idea because our aging process is a dynamic process and so should beautification be. It should be dynamic as well. So yeah. basically generations of Hollywood actors mm. has went through the knife and went through all these to give the younger generation of dermatologists some insight not, not to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean we learn and we get better with every generation. So it's easy to uh, look back and say, oh, how come that was done? Just like yeah. how we're using smartphones now and in those olden days it would be those big Mobira phones, right? That you carry and plug into the back of your car. You can kill a dog this. with that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's continue. Okay, this is acne. Yes. And I think I think this is very satisfying, right? Mm. You have helped a young girl, a beautiful young girl, to regain a hundred percent beauty. She's a beautiful girl. Mm. Tell us about this case. Okay, she's actually um, working in a big pharma company, mm. and she came to me very depressed, and she said. Uh, she's actually from another country, but I can't mention for anonymity purposes. No problem. Uh, and she said, you know, I've been to three or four uh, doctors, okay, uh, aesthetic doctors as well, and I've had a few injections, a few lasers, but things only got worse. Then she's been for lots of different facials, and still things couldn't improve. And I spent about half an hour, 45 minutes, explaining to her what the root cause of the problem is, what causes acne, dietary causes, genetic causes, Okay. lifestyle factors. 
And what is the root cause of the problem is the sebaceous gland producing too much oil and you're in a hot, humid country. So what can you do to stop that? How to modify your diet and so on? And within two or three months of medications, doing a specific uh, form of treatment called hydrafacial, where we suck out all the black and white heads externally. And then we do the laser to correct the pigment and the blood vessels. This is what we managed to achieve after four months. Okay. And this she's is amazing, it. right? Yeah. yeah. So, and um, the story to this after that was that um, she told her aunt, who was based in London, uh, and said, can you recommend someone in London? So I gave, I gave her some names. Um, and then the message back to me was, your friend is very expensive. So I say, why? Oh, for consultation is 290 pounds for 15 minutes. And with 290 pounds in Malaysia, you can get one whole session done, medicine, facial, and the laser with me. And so she asked the aunt to fly home. 500 pounds flight, and she stayed for two months to fix her face. And then she went back to the UK. Oh. Yeah. Ah. So <laughs> that was a very, uh, very satisfying, you know, sort of uh, thing to be involved with. So you could do actually um, tourism uh, medicine? Yes. I've had patients who have come from uh, Bali, from Indonesia, Caucasians, mm. who have had skin cancers, uh, and they will come uh, to mm. the clinic and they say, you know, there's a list of budget hotels opposite my clinic. I'm not sure. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so yeah, know. there was a patient who came on a, on a Monday. I did the surgery and then uh, reviewed him on Thursday, Friday. And then when I gave him the green light, he flew back to Bali. So he was staying opposite my clinic for five days. Every time I just peek out the window and I'm open, he will just walk down and come and see me. <laughs> so yeah. So basically you do your surgery in your clinic, right? Correct. Yes. Inside your clinic. So you yes. have a full surgery, yes. surgery room uh, ready there. And, uh, yes. and there's not many dermatologists actually does that. It's very, very few. You are about the first guy that I know mm -hmm. who actually does dermatology surgery. And uh, okay, you know, this is, this is getting very interesting, uh, Adrian. Mm -hmm. Now, this young guy, same thing, acne, but this is a bit more serious, right? She ha he, has a, he has bad scarring, yes. but you managed to actually mm -hmm. basically smooth out the scar. How, what do you do? Yes, okay. Very interesting story with this one, because the, uh, from the time when we started using uh, lasers, I've always thought that we have to use surgical methods. <laughs> And the conventional teaching that I was taught uh, as a dermatologist in the UK was to use punch excision, where we use a piece of metal to grind a hole and then lift it up and then stitch it. Because those are holes, right? Okay. So lasers back then, we had carbon dioxide laser, burn the whole layer off and then let it grow back. It's like polishing a marble floor. Oh. But when I came back to Asia, I realised you can't do that. Because if you do that to a Chinese skin, they will come back looking like someone has robbed them and they have been dragged on the road. It's all brown and all pigmented after that because of the sun exposure and also the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So I'm fortunate enough to have been able to explore on a few relatives. Okay? And I was, um, this takes a lot of uh, trial and error. So I went through a number of laser machines and we went through a couple of different settings. And it took me about nine months to hone this. And we managed to find a setting whereby we can do the laser. You can go off on the beach in the sun do whatever you want, there's no uh, restrictions, and they come back looking like that. So I'm very proud to say that you know, we can do something as drastic as that without surgery and without the risk of pigmentation. Hmm. I mean, seriously, you know, to all my clients and all my audience out there, if you, want to, if you want to get your skin done, please go and see him, right? <laughs> you know, my, if you have insurance policy with him, my insurance will pay, you know. <laughs> but make sure you can see him. <laughs> so, now, tell us about this. This is double eyelid. Yes. I thought this is done by plastic surgeons, but you, you are doing this as well. Yeah. So, for um, skin cancer work, we do remove lesions, growths on the on upper the eyelid, eyelid yes. on the nose, on the side eye. of the temple and so on. So, this is a fairly simple one. I don't do lower uh, blepharoplasties because the lower ones I normally refer to my oculoplastic colleagues. But for the upper lid, um, this young lady basically said that one side was uh, not looking quite the same as the other. 
and from the top there's a lot of hooding, too much extra skin. Okay? And she wanted something more permanent. So this was fairly simple. It's just taking a bit of extra skin off and then stitching it together. Mm. Uh, and the recovery is pretty quick for a young patient like her. Mm -hmm. right? okay? uh, but bear in mind, it's not suitable for everyone. And surgery is not always the answer. Mm. There are a lot of devices out there, a lot of other procedures like thread, uh, filler or Botox, or even high-intensity focus ultrasound, that you can achieve the, a more uh, satisfactory results without having to undergo the knife. So even though as a dermatological surgeon, we have the option, but mm -hmm. we can always go uh, you know, uh, easy by using all the other uh, treatments that are less scary. So let me just put it in contrary. Um, after listening to, to you for half an hour, anything to do with the face, if it's not involved huge surgery, you can actually do it. Yes. So anything that involves a huge surgery, take example, rhinoplasty, you know, to lift up your nose or, or thickening your lips, all these are done by plastic, plastic surgeons. Plastics and some ENT surgeons as well. And ENT surgeons, yes, I heard ENT surgeons. Yeah. So, but anything superficial on the skin, you can solve that. Yes, that's right. You got it. So he's the guy to see. You know, I now know who, who to see on my on the, on the skins. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna recommend a lot of clients to you. A lot of these, a lot of my clients who are all these rich, middle-aged ladies will love to come and see you. <laughs> so now, tell us who should avoid aesthetic medicines? Who should actually avoid it totally? Okay. Now, people who uh, should avoid aesthetic medicine will not have insight, meaning that they would often go from one doctor to another. And by the time they come to you, or me rather, they would say, actually, I've already seen uh, two or three other aesthetic doctors or plastic surgeons, and they keep telling me I shouldn't do it. That's always the alarm bell. And to me, that is a, a, an, an issue with self-image. And I think with that, we would actually need more psychological help and psychiatric evaluation. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about people who are seeing things, hearing things, or think that other people want to kill them. It's basically the people who, when they wake up and they feel that, for example, their right eyebrow is much higher than their left eyebrow, and they're very fixated on that, the moment you say it's not true, they get really angry with you. And I think those people should stay away from aesthetic medicine because it's a very dangerous field in the sense that you would be correcting, or rather in the surgeon's eye or the doctor's eye, it would actually be worsening of their looks. But to them, it is improvement of their looks, which comes back to the point of the definition of aesthetic medicine. Yeah. So when the two doesn't marry and doesn't agree, then one should not pursue it. So there is in, in America, there is this guy called the human version of Kent. Mm. You know, the Barbie doll Kent? Mm, yes. Have you seen that guy? Mm, I haven't. <laughs> the, guy had multiple, the guy has done like maybe 60 plastic surgeries on him. Mm. What is wrong with this person? You know, tell us, I mean, as, as a doctor's point of view, not, we are not passing judgment. Mm. We are just purely uh, engaging in a conversation on this. Mm. What is wrong with people who, were gone through, who go through like 80, 90 plastic surgery to look so artificially pumped up, you know? Mm. What, is your, what, what is your view on that? Yeah. Now, I think aesthetic medicine is interesting because it's a little bit like art, where it's very subjective. Okay? Subjective in the way that if you had the definition of yourself looking like you were 20 years old, even though you're 80, okay, some people may perceive that as being all right. But for other people, they would think, look, you were my classmate and you looked like that when you, were, when you were 20, but now when you're 80, you should look a little bit closer to maybe 60 or 70 at least. And I think that is defined by human norms, by society, right? So it's a very difficult question to answer in the sense that it places a judgment on the value of what is important and close to you, okay? But what I can comment on is the fact that if you had a significant problem with your skin and that stops you from doing the job that you, can, that you want to do, for example, if you're air stewardess or someone in the service sector, and you have a really bad, big pus pimple on the cheek and no one wants to see you, right? So that clearly is a real medical issue. 
that translates into benefits of aesthetic medicine, improving your quality of life. But on the other hand, if you are in a position where you, know, you are trying to improve yourself beyond what normal society would expect, then I think that's when people start to raise eyebrows. Yeah? So, but I think um, each person for their own. I think these are personal values. True. It's difficult to comment. I think yeah. it's personal value. I think it is, it is his choice to make. And um, I, have a, I, I do have a doctor uh, who is a plastic one of the best in, in town. He told me, Renan, you cannot believe one thing. Throughout my 25 years being a plastic surgeon, the prettiest girl will come to me and tell me they want a book job. And, I, and the doctor will say, you know, he said, Renan, they have the perfect book, the perfect body, and they still want a book job. Mm. Mm. Sometimes he has to spend hours to talk them down. You know, mm. it is personal yes. thing. You know, you, you might see a beauty in it, but she doesn't. Mm. She wants it better. Mm. You know, and, and that's that's not. That is personal preference, uh, I would say. Mm. You know. Yeah. Mm. So tell us where can we find you? Okay, so you can type uh, into Ways uh, AY Skin Specialist Clinic, and it will bring you straight there. That's <laughs> it. It's as simple as that. <laughs> so his clinic is right. Opposite Starling Mall is at uh, Damansara, uh, Damansara Uptown. Mm -hmm. It is very easy to find. Mm -hmm. It is just on the main road. It's very easy to park. There's no reason to say cannot go get back in, cannot find you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to say thank you so much. Thank you, Adrian, for coming to the show. And uh, I think what, whatever you have shared with us gave us value in understanding aesthetic medicine and who should do it, who should not. What are the safer way to do it and for Asians I think you have carved out a new basically a new new kind of treatment like to, to take care of Asian skin mm. and in our weather mm. and then that is applaudable so anybody who has a skin problem please go and see Dr. Adrian Yong if you have a problem with the insurance policy come and see me <laughs> I'll sort it out for you right so any last word for the uh, for the audience before we go Thank you very much, Renan, for uh, inviting me. And this is a very unique platform to share this with. So thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So next week, we will see Cheryl Tan in our show. Cheryl Tan is the Bo Cameronian Best Actor winner this year. And she is also a familiar face on Singapore media and amazing jazz singer. Thank you so much, Adrian, for coming up. And I'll see you again. All right, okay. let's catch up for coffee again, Thank right? You. Thank you. Thank All you. Right.